Yeah, yeah, excellent. So we can go into that. So before, but before we do that, let's just deal singularly with your point. So what we say as people who believe in the creator, just this hammering at this point before we go into the other phase, is a universe from nothing. Because obviously the science can only go far so far in terms of its empirical proof. We're dealing with the matters of the phys metaphysical over here. So we're there, hence we have to go into the philosophy of science, which although lots of people are disinclined towards, it becomes a necessity when I speak to gentlemen such as yourself. So in this case, a universe from nothing. Does that make any sense? No, because by definition, nothing is the absence of everything and anything. That's number one. Number two, did the universe create itself, which would be an absurdity, which I've already given the analogy of, so what is the of a plausibility? Something created the universe which is beyond the universe, not contingent unlike all the other contingent set of dependent things. It has to be necessary by its very definition and it can not be any other way. Hence, this is the understanding that a universe which is all made up of parts and individuality of these parts, something independent of these parts, which is not contingent and necessary, has to be the cause of the universe. Because this is the very fluctuate, fluctuating nature that we live in today, with the advancement of science, we understand that the universe came into existence. These are key words which I'm using. Came. That's the Big Bang. Yes. But there's also the theory of the Big Crunch. Yes, Big Crunch or the quantum. And yeah. There's another theory that in, that takes both that subsumes both of those theories, which is the idea that the universe is in a constant cycle of Perpetual, expansion, yes, crunch, retraction, expansion, yes, crunch. retraction, yes. So. Who are you to say that there must have been a beginning? Because even that, when you're using that term by definition, it says that if that is an event which is occurring, extraction and retraction, the fact still remains that something is within that sphere which is allowing this contraction and retraction to take place. So, do you understand what I mean? So, that is what you've argued there is still, in essence, a composition of the universe which is made up of parts. So Dan, this is not a fallacy of composition either. It makes it makes perfect sense. What you said is just that these are elements within the parts of the universe, which are protruded then by the fact that the universe in its entirety cannot therefore be beyond this independent set of chain of events, which we've um, we're trying to like um, we speak about. So even that within itself, I think, is negated by that point I've made. What do you think? I've got to say, you're a very well-spoken man. Thank you. Delighted speaking to you, Duncan. But what I would invite you to understand, my friend, is that with that plausibility and with that coherence of thought, it's more of a plausibility of there being a creator. So even as an atheist who wants to give his definition, the, the, the common understanding that we have, that, that we, I've entailed, is in quotation marks, we, we, the repetition, don't know, don't know, don't know. What we give is an understanding, a reason understanding, and if you think that reason understanding is not satisfactory, then try to beat it. But it's, uh, it's, it's not breachable. I believe it's not breachable because it is coherent in its very structure and very formulation. So with that in mind then, we believe we're only here for a limited time. Our creator is created for a purpose, and it's, we're not here purposelessly. So God gives us a method of wanting to live one's life. It makes no sense to me. Just say we've established, not that I'm saying you necessarily agree with me, but just say you've established a crater. It makes no plausible sense that that crater would then definitively say, right, I don't want nothing to do with you. I've created you. Get on with it. I'll judge you in a few thousand years and I'll give you eternal damnation or eternal bliss. And by that very juncture, by that very proxy, you will lead your life and I will judge you. No, he, we, will, we will appear before God and say, oh, our creator, you never gave us guidance. How we live. You gave us no objective morality which to follow. Have you ever heard of Russell's tea One of the philosophers, yes. You've heard of Russell's tea Yeah, I have. I've heard so of Russell, what's David Hume. What's your response to that? Then? Which, which uh, part of Russell's tea point are you referring to? Which specific so, things? The idea that the only rational thing one can conclude from the existence or non-existence of God is that that is the only thing you can debate. Whether or not God loves or hates the gays, whether or not God loves or hates adultery, whether or not God has advanced opinions on metaphysics, yes. or whether or not God is even sentient and it's just a force of, a, a metaphysical force of 
generated by life forms which are sentient. How can you how can you justify your belief in a system of rules to live by when the only rational thing you can decide on is whether or not God exists or does not exist? So what we say in terms of that is that God is the overall arbitrator of objective morality. So, for example, us as human beings, we are subject to the time and conditioning that we're in. Let me ask you a quick question. I'm not trying to throw this out as putting a cat amongst the pigeons. What are your views, if you just very briefly tell me, on LGBTQ? Very briefly, very briefly. If you're not hurting anyone, I don't give a shit. What's your views on incest? It's not something you should do because you have bad children, but at the end of the day, it's free love, you know? So, okay, so if two consenting adults who are both of a sound disposition and they want to associate the physicality within their relationship and their blood, uh, blood siblings, and the moral construct that we live in today, that would be defined as unacceptable at this moment in time. However, from what I'm gathering from you, from what you're saying, correct me if I'm wrong, please, because I don't want to put words in your mouth, is essentially that um, that would be deemed as appropriate to them if they're not harming anyone. The same harm principle is applying as, as with LGBTQ, for example. Would you say that's the case? Have I made a good case for that? So you would say it's acceptable for a brother and sister to cohabit and have sexual relations if they're two consenting individuals. Well, two consenting adults, I have no problem. Okay, so now we get into the now we get into the issue of what is defined as morality and objectivity of that morality. Who is the arb who is the one who definitively defines that? So what yeah. So what we then assess is that just say for example, we all are compelled towards a same sex attraction. All of us. Just as an example. Just say it's innate as the argument goes. Just say each and every one of us goes through that phase. And we decide, I'm, I'm going to stick to that phase. How will human civilization uh, procreate? It will come to a catastrophic end. That's impossible. Because it's impossible because 99% of people will never, will never even think of having relations with another man. Never mind, never mind, never mind. A hundred percent of everyone all having same relations at the same time. That's impossible. Yeah, but what I'm saying to you is that in the, in the, in the, just say even a person of a, of a um, opposite sex attraction will go through a phase, I'm using my words very carefully here, it goes through a phase that he feels attracted, or he or she, whatever, feels attracted to the same individual. I mean, the same sex individual. And by that notion, that is what he wishes. Not everyone will go through that. Fine, not everyone will, but that's in... The vast majority will always remain heterosexual. Right, but that is in the ubiquitous world scenario that we're living in current reality. However, that is not the case if that was to be an inclination that we then go forward with. So just say, for example, A finds... A, John finds Mike attractive. John is by nature, just say, heterosexual. But he's found Mike attractive today. He sees Mike, he wants to go with what he, what he wants to go with, and he wants a relationship with that individual. That individual then wants a, a bond, a union. Okay? Now, where does that leave? And it, just say each and every one of us go through that little but, phase. But each and it's a hypothetical... Past that phase. Pardon? Each and every one of us... Well, each and every, the majority of each and every one of us will go past the phase and that's fine. Life will continue. Right, but that's in, that is in the reality scheme of things. But if you're going to go with your inclination at that time, because I'm assuming, because your first argumentation was, if you notice carefully, that a person who wishes to do that, then the harm principle is not there, you're fine with it. So I'm saying to you then, that's based upon your instinct. So if you carry that instinct and you then come into an, a, a relationship with a person of the same sex and you want that inclination and you're saying it, it can pass, but if by, by manner of the way we've suggested this, that, well, that they, they it cohabit... Will pass. It will pass for everyone. Well, that's an assumption, isn't it, really? But it's also an assumption to assume that everyone is heteronormative. Well, I'm not making that assumption. I'm speaking in the generic, general understanding. If that was the initial inclination that one would have, you see, so then you'd be binded to that individual in essence. What do you think of, uh, um, you know, multi, multiple sexual partners? 
no yeah, bother with yeah, me. No bother with you. But what if it bothers the other individual? I mean, if a married, if, if a husband, but what if a husband and wife then are married to each other, and um, it, it happens in a relationship that one becomes rather truant, shall we say, say sexually truant? Open, open relationships are a thing. So, in your view, there is no real boundary to any form of morality. So you would argue everything goes. In, in essence, knows. what about necrophilia, bestiality? We, 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 live, we, live, we live in a world that is cold and uncaring. The universe, there's this famous saying by Einstein that God does not play dice with the universe. Well, have a look at that man right there. Yes. You see, yeah, so now we're going to refer to the problem of evil, the common grudge against God. Why it's not, it has. It's not a grudge against God. Yeah. Is that. Does, well, let me ask you a question. Does yeah. God talk to you? God reveals. Through our Quran, our revelation, how one leads one's life. Was it God so he's who not going to. Pardon? Was it God, God was the who, one who. No, did, he, did he physically write the Quran? No, he didn't physically write the Quran. The then Quran was revealed. Was the person interpreting God's action? Yes. Well, so you're telling me that if God was to speak to me right now and tell me yeah. that I should murder every single person in sight right now, yeah. I should do that. But that, but that, but that God defines that. God himself. But God, God has specifically told me, oh, if God told me right now, mm. hey, I've got a new revelation for you, we're going to write a new holy book. And I wrote that holy book. And I showed that to people and said, this is God's word right now. Yeah. But would, that, that, would, that, would that be something you would read and go, well, it must be God who wrote that. But that is something... That's the same thing people 2,000 years ago did with no, but what you, what, the Quran. What you've, what you've said there is something you've assumed about God. That is contrary. God says in the Quran that if you kill one person, it's, it's, it's as if you've killed all of humanity. Oh, but that, that's not the point. The point is, is that man is fallible yes. and God acts through man. Right, but the, what, then you not you then observe what that man's. And it was a uh, man who wrote the Quran, just like a man wrote the Bible. Fair well, enough, but what God is the teaching that of Bible. that? But what I'm trying to say to you is, what is it intrinsically within the Quran that you have found? If it's come for the for the source of a man, which is claim it's come from a divine being, that is intrinsic within the Quran, that is going against what you would feel is because inertly against your on, beliefs. On, the, on that note, yeah. just just. To Do you agree to answer this question, though, oh, I think. Sorry, go ahead. So basically, what I've just tried to ask you again. Is what is it within the Quran, a revelation revealed through the conduit of the Prophet Muhammad, upon whom be peace, that you could take objection to? That's the, that's the point we need to come to, based upon that, uh, the premise that you put forward. Stone the apostates, stone the gays. Um, women are subjugate to man's control and domain. Okay, I, have no, I have no wish to. Okay, let's do let's deal with the latter point first of all about the subjugate apparent subjugation of women. Now, with due respect, my friend, Duncan, no, you, ahead, you, you've made the claim. I've so, no, no problem. No, that's fine. No, you've made, it's just don't, I don't want to... don't have to mince your words. No, 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 no I'm, not, I'm not here to mince. It's just I'm a bit worried about my prayers as well. I don't want to delay the prayer any further. Oh, you... Uh, oh, no, no, no. no, no, no I, don't want it, but I don't want to see it as a cop-out. I don't want to see it as a cop-out either. What's it's the not time? A it's not yeah. a cop-out. Yeah, yeah. That is deeply personal to you. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Thank you. Don't go, though, please. A while ago, it's 9.48. I so actually, I have to be sleeping. I'm sorry, okay. sir. All right. It was lovely chatting with you. Nice speaking to you. I mean, the you prayer does come first. Day, I can't yeah. answer this question. I yeah. But I would love to answer, but the prayer comes first. I mean, if you'd come 15 minutes earlier, we could have gone on. Or if you're happy to wait for a few minutes. I've got to run. I've got to run because okay. it's tired, okay. man. Okay, nice speaking to you. It was lovely okay. speaking to you. Okay, we take care, Duncan. Day. Gentlemen, you are. Thank you. So I had a, speak, we had a chat with Duncan, who was, we were going, to, going on to some other points. So we spoke about the, the natural um, uh, distinct di um, d discussions that we have with, with Christians. So we found some of my points re reasonable and then we went on to some side points. But it's time for Salah, for Maghrib Salah. I don't want to miss my prayer, no matter how much we you know, go into depth. But I think there's something for him, inshallah, to consider. May Allah guide us all. Assalamu alaikum.